Hello, and welcome to this video on survival of the fittest. This is a phrase sometimes attributed to Darwin and his theory of evolution, but the concept existed well before that, even if it wasn't phrased as neatly. It describes the process by which the most well-adapted or suitable members of the species will pass on their genes through children, and therefore represent an ever-growing portion of the species. Meanwhile, those with an adverse gene or mutation will represent an ever-diminishing proportion of the population. Let's take a hypothetical situation. A hot, dry and rocky environment, somewhere with little or no water or vegetation. How is a creature to get by? Fortunately, anyone living in a major metropolitan environment can tell you how. Rats. These vermin can get by in a harsh situation by scavenging, breeding profusely, and learning. They have a GI tract that can consume just about anything, and a physiology, if not robust, is at least resilient. This means that they have an ever-growing population, which is hard to control. We have seen similar processes of adaptation. The quintessential example is Darwin's finches, birds that each diversified and specialised to live on a specific food group or in certain habitats. This allowed them to monopolise that food or area which meant that they had constant resources to live on. This is just a convenient example used to demonstrate the principle, but does not cover the other end of the process. What happens if a gene is adversely active? What if a finch was now competing with a local species that already had that particular trait, food or habitat niche? The survival process is one of adaptation. Adaptation of an individual or even a single generation does nothing. It must be inherited or passed on to the next generations so they also have an advantage. There is no benefit to a species in finding a way to make fire if none of the offspring of that species can do the same. Imagine if we never been able to make heat again. The same way that if a species develops a trait for one generation that can use it in the next, they will have retained their advantage over other members of the same species and other species. This idea is reasonably straightforward to us as a species now. We can see how one small thing can lead to a huge change over the long term. Small things that are obvious to us can be easily overlooked, but other things seem more esoteric or obscure. They need to be dug out, cleaned and examined closely so that we may better understand them. This is especially true in the case of genetic changes through pure random chance. The members of the species with this may then find a way to use that mutation. Think of a creature with long arms or taller height, able to access things further away, if they can then feed on or use this height to their advantage. They will reproduce more frequently. They will more often than not mate with members of the species who have the same or similar traits, which leads to them becoming reinforced and therefore a stronger or more common trait. In other cases, this mutation is not advantageous. An example of an established trait can be seen in places like the Nordic countries and Africa. In the north, access to sunlight, vitamin D and good health is limited over winter. This is why fair hair and skin is needed. More light gets through the skin and activates vitamin D, leading to better health. Obviously, those who had darker skin 
would have had less health and likely represented an ever smaller fraction of the population of early human occupation. Conversely, darker skin is of benefit in Africa where melanin content helps to protect from harmful UV rays. If either circumstance were reversed, the people with those traits would be far worse off. This is why evolution is largely driven by selection for and retention of these traits that provide a benefit, but also the diminishing if not outright removal of those traits which tend to be to the detriment of a species. This leads to the problem with survival of the fittest, a particularly glaring one. A species that has developed a suitably specialised set of skills that they become hyper-specialised cannot readily change its circumstances. Think about how humans are this weird and uncomfortable mix of carnivore and herbivore making us an opportunistic feeder. We crave proteins and fats, but at the same time, we cannot consume them to excess or subsist only on meat. Doing so will cause liver damage among other systems. On the other hand, we struggle to consist only on plants with several essential dietary items missing a very interesting and niche example of both of these events, a beneficial and adverse mutation, occurs in sickle cell anemia and malaria. The malaria parasite exists in humans as an invader of red blood cells. Sickle cell anemia, as the name suggests, distorts red blood cells into an abstract shape. This strange shape leads to a higher turnover of the cells and more immune system activity. When someone contracts the mutation leading to anemia, they are less prone to be as sick from the malaria parasite. This means they can reproduce better in their particular circumstances. If they were to have both copies of a gene mutate, then the gene that is responsible for the cell shape would cause them to get much sicker and probably die. With one mutation of one copy, they are relatively disease resistant. If they were to live somewhere that did not have rampant malaria, then they would be relatively sick, even with a single mutant copy of the gene responsible for sickle cell anemia. What is interesting for humans now is that we may still be undergoing a form of selection based on survival of the fittest, not with gross mutations that will necessarily create a new species, but instead inherited mutations of an epigenetic sort. In a growing but somewhat contentious field of study, Epigenetics, which include things like DNA methylation, finds there is a possibility of offspring carrying some of these same epigenetic markers. If it is a product of a healthy lifestyle, environment and more, then some children may well inherit more than just a broad better fitness for life, but distinct gene modifications that are a product of their parents' healthy lifestyle. This may in part be why we are seeing an increase in the average height in each generation. They are better fed, have access to more overall nutrition, and have fewer periods of adverse nutrition or health. This leads to each generation having a genetic predisposition towards greater height. There are also social factors that are better described by studies into dating services and apps that are linked below. We then have tall people reproducing with tall people, creating a trait that has become entrenched in, in society. 
as they become more common due to the variety of causes like nutrition and selecting for height in partners. They represent a growing proportion of people. This will continue until the day this they become so tall that it becomes a hindrance such as hitting door frames or not fitting in beds. At this point, the natural selection procedures will begin to favour those of smaller stature. There is one interesting question coming out of this with regards to humans. The most successful humans in terms of money, power, prestige, and so on, no longer reproduce like the usual models would expect. Instead, they have fewer children and often later in life. They have effectively throttled the genes that led to their success from promulgating throughout the species. This may indicate a pattern of the species effectively self-limiting itself. This information has already been said in part, but is a useful and important reminder of how simple, single, and even whole ranges of traits can be important in determining how well an organism will survive in adverse conditions. It does not define only what is good for a species, but also what is bad, and how these two different values balance in a given step of evolution based on local conditions and how those circumstances play out in the long term. Nietzsche had it close to right when he said, What does not kill me makes me stronger, but it should be slightly modified to What does not kill me makes my offspring stronger. Thank you for watching this video. If you have found it interesting or useful, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions below.